Now that we've gotten the landscape of SOA circa 2011 with our great case studies, it's time now to drill deeper with our expert SOA sessions. And for this one, I'm joined by Alistair Farkason, CTO at SOA Software. Alistair, welcome back. Thanks, Vance. Looking forward to it. At SOA Software, Alistair Farkason spearheads product design and development and helps enterprise customers implement SOA for ongoing business benefits. He is a noted expert in custom application development, distributed environments, architecting scalable hardware and software, and SOA and SOA governance. Prior to joining SOA Software, he worked at U.S. Interactive, where he was a key advisor to the CTO on many companies regarding Internet architecture issues. In his session, Best Practices for SOA Governance, Alistair describes three keys to successful SOA projects, clear business alignment, measurable ROI, and a more agile IT environment. He also connects the dots to show how important it is to apply these keys across the whole SOA lifecycle, from design, development, test, deploy, and update. We'll see how SOA governance has become one of today's most popular ways companies are accomplishing this balancing act. Just a quick reminder, if you haven't already done so, you can download Alistair's slides by clicking the download button at the right, and to ask a question, simply type into the submit a question box. And now, Alistair, tell us about best practices for SOA governance. Thank you. So not to repeat myself, but certainly I think it's worthwhile to review sort of why SOA in the first place. I think that it's important to note that SOA is about transforming an IT department, and it is about aligning that IT department ultimately with your company's business goals. I think that a successful SOA strategy needs to provide a transparent business alignment. It needs to have and demonstrate a measurable return on investment. And it really needs to provide, at the end of the day, a more agile IT environment. So let's look a little bit at the challenge. The challenge that we've found with SOA is that SOA is not about technology. It's really something that is about people and processes. So I would say that a successful SOA strategy is one that aligns first people and processes and then ultimately takes care of a technology that is going to implement and manage those people and processes. So it's not primarily a technical problem, and it cannot be solved by technology alone. And it's also not something, and I think that this is probably the key point here that people have sort of lost sight of, it's not something that can be done outside of a business context or without any business support. If I just think over the, the past sort of five years and think of the SOA projects that have succeeded and the ones that have failed, the ones that have failed have typically been those projects that have had no business support, no executive sponsorship, no ability to actually meet their end goals, and just end up with a bunch of technology that ultimately costs a lot of money and slows down your operational environment. So I think it's really important to establish the context of your SOA initiative within some sort of business goals and along with business support. And I'm going to elaborate this as I go through my presentation. So let's look at the common best practices that I'm seeing. And I'm going to talk anecdotally about these best practices and try and put them in the context of real-world scenarios or customer case studies. The first best practice, as you might have gathered, is people, process, then technology. I'm going to talk about how to take care of the people and processes within your organization and then ultimately start looking at technology. Speaking of technology, there is a tool for every job. The SOA landscape, like many other technical landscapes within our day-to-day -day jobs, is complex. And there are many, many tools that can do many, many different things. And there's always a danger that if you have a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. So what I'm going to try and do is talk about which tools to get and which people should be using those tools and which function those tools should actually provide. The third best practice I'm going to discuss is end-to-end. -end. I'm talking about how one should actually look at the entire life cycle. Then I'm going to also talk about integrate and automate. And I covered this in my introductory session, but integrating and automating provides return on investment and lower total cost of ownership for a service-oriented architecture. And then last but not least, I'm going to also discuss what I call closing the loop, which is essentially how do you actually provide a way of enforcing 
the policies and a way of implementing the policies in your environment with the minimal amount of impact. So let's start at the beginning. People, processes, then technology. So we have seen SOA strategies initiated by different parts of the organization. And if I look at the sales engagements we've had with our customers over the past few years, I can see that we sort of see SOA initiatives on three fronts. The first one being an IT-led initiative. Primarily, an IT department is looking to monitor and secure their environment. The problem with tackling it at that level is that it's very difficult for an IT department to justify new tools. Imagine if I'm an IT department and I want to go out and purchase some SOA tools and I go to the business and say, well, you know, this SOA tool provides me with the ability of monitoring and securing my services. The likelihood is they'll turn around and say, well, you already have three tools to do monitoring and five tools to do security. Why do you need another one? And it's very, very difficult to actually justify the acquisition of a set of tools that do monitoring and security without the context of a larger SOA initiative. The second group of people we often interact with is development groups. Development groups are typically focused on a particular project or constrained within a particular line of business, and their focus on services we find to be very bottom-up. So what I mean by that is they are trying to simplify their service development initiatives. They are trying to perhaps simplify how they build services or perhaps provide or supply a repository of services to the broader organization. Now, what we find with initiatives that are led by a development group is it's very often limited to a single project or line of business. And in this case, again, it's difficult to justify the purchase of a tool, and you very often don't have enough clout within the organization to create best practices that are applicable to the whole organization. And what you end up having is you end up producing services that nobody else uses and nobody else cares about. You end up spending a lot of money building those services without any measurable return on investment. The most successful projects that we encounter are ones that are driven and led by enterprise architecture, CIO, office of the CTO, that kind of group within the organization. These are most successful because they are driven by the business and they have sufficient support to implement change across the organization. They are essentially responsible and capable of leading a transformation initiative within the company. They are also capable of realizing a return on investment, not because they are technically more competent, but just because they are more capable of aligning the service initiatives with what's going on in the business. They are more capable of getting the levels of reuse because they have access to a larger organization. The problem that you might already know or be aware of is that it's sometimes difficult for these organizations within the company to generate the consensus and budget that they require. So they often have to go to each of the project teams and each of the lines of business and get their consensus and financial support to implement an SOA. We do, however, find that to be a simpler problem to solve than one that comes up through the other two avenues, where you've built a bunch of services and no one cares about them, or you're just implementing another monitoring and security tool, and it's lost all recognition as being an SOA initiative in the first place. So our most successful projects are EA, CIO, Office of the CTO-led, and that's simply because the problem is not one about technology, but rather one about people and process and business alignment, and in many cases, politics within an organization, simply because this is a strategic and transforming initiative within a company. So let's look at the next best practice, choosing the right tool for the job. So in my last slide, I harped on about people and process and getting the right sort of support within the organization. And I mentioned that tooling is tertiary to people and process within the company. That said, you still need to choose the right tools. And there's a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt out there as to which tools to use. And I think there's a lot of misrepresentation of tools in the marketplace. Before I go into the specific tools, let's just talk about why SOA initiatives actually need a technology investment. So 
So it's really, really difficult to control people and to communicate a process without some medium to reach those people and a way to actually communicate that process. So I think that whatever technology investments are made need to be looked at in that light. They need to be tools that help you manage people and change and communicate processes within the organization. The second thing is, is the tools need to help you measure your return on investment. When you go into an SOA project, you're probably going to have to justify your own existence and establish some sort of criteria by which you're going to measure the success of this initiative at the end of a year or two years or six months. So the tools that you choose need to be able to actually provide that measurable return on investment. The tools also need to be able to automate and audit the governance processes that you put in place. I'll talk a little bit about automation later on when I talk about integrate and automate, but essentially automation actually adds to the return on investment and lowers the total cost of ownership of SOA. It simplifies the development processes that you put in place and it actually offers a carrot back to the organization as to why you need to make a tool investment in the first place. When you look at tools, you need to look at the entire life cycle. Planning, development, and operational aspects all need to be considered, and they all need different tools. And as I mentioned, I'll also get to this later on when I talk about the entire life cycle. The danger that exists is that choosing the wrong tools or having the wrong focus can really put an organization down a rat hole. You can spend a lot of time analyzing a tool or spending a lot of time trying to get that square peg to fit in that round hole to implement whatever development processes and governance processes you want to put into place. So it's really important that you choose the right tool. That said, common mistakes are building a bunch of services. So if you think about my last slide where some SOA governance projects or SOA initiatives are driven by development, in many cases what happens is a service gets built for a service's sake. It's not built with some end use in mind or a consumer in mind. So in many cases, many failures can be related to just building a bunch of services that nobody uses at the end of the day. Another common mistake is looking at the architecture as a homogenous entity as opposed to a heterogeneous entity. Most of our customers are heterogeneous. They have multiple platforms, multiple ESBs, multiple BPM tools, multiple development environments. So the SOA problem as a whole is a heterogeneous one. If you tackle a particular line of business or a particular development organization, the danger is that you would tackle it with a single technology in mind. And the processes and practices you put into place will not apply to other technologies within the organization. And that's the danger as well. The other danger is forcing consolidation and standardization using an ESB. I believe that an ESB is a bit of a misnomer in that it is not an enterprise service bus. It's very, very difficult to consolidate and standardize on a single ESB within an organization. Simply because organizations are heterogeneous and every single platform vendor offers their own ESB. So just by the general nature of developers and the general nature of organizations, you will end up with more than one ESB. So instead of trying to force everyone to consolidate and standardize on a single ESB, which will be very difficult to manage and very difficult to gain consensus for, a better approach is just to let everyone have their own ESB and ensure that you can govern them all evenly. The last common mistake we find is that registries and repositories have a special purpose and a particular target audience. It's very, very difficult to implement a runtime registry and get a development team to use it or get a operations person to leverage a development repository. It is not a case of one size fits all. You have to look at the life cycle and you have to look at the people that are using the tools. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on.